The Spirit is with the unbeliever, convicting him of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. He is there when the person believes, and it's his is the work of new birth. Titus 3, 5 says that we are saved by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is very active in the believer, bringing about Amen. new birth. We can't say that he's not with them. That's right. But there is an experience that we can call the baptism or the fullness in actual fact, in Acts chapter 8, it's actually called the receiving of the Holy Spirit. But mm. I'll come back to that. <laughs> Let me just look at Acts chapter 8 for a moment. Philip goes down to Samaria. He preaches Jesus. They believe what he's preaching about Jesus. They are baptized in the name of Jesus. And for, in my book, that means that at that moment, mm. they are fully Christian. Mm. They're born again. They're saved. They're on their way to heaven. Not because the baptism saves them, but because they no. wouldn't have been baptized until they, there was a recognition. But the baptism was, was a kind of a, a confirmation <laughs> of their personal yes. acceptance of Jesus Amen. Christ as Savior. They would believed the gospel. Yes. And so this group of people, it, to my book, these are saved Amen. for men. But it says, as yet, they hadn't received the, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. <laughs> and so Peter and John come down and they lay hands on them and they pray for them. And again, it's spoken of as they received the Holy Spirit. And uh, something very special must have happened then, because I must, when he sang, when he saw it, he says, hey, I want that power that you've got. That when you lay hands on people, he'd seen all the miracles, mm. and he gets this desire for supernatural things. And there must have been something supernatural yeah. about this laying on of hands for the Holy Spirit, because he wants it, so that by the, by the laying on of his hands, he should be able to give it, and he, of course he tries to buy it. You can't, <laughs> because what we're talking about here, my friends, is not something you can earn or buy by your goodness, by your mm. tithing, by your praying. What we're talking about is something that God graciously Amen. gives us, but it was distinct. Can I take you then on to uh, chapter um, 10 of, of Acts, and uh, uh, Peter is speaking in the house of Cornelius, and the Spirit falls on them. Yes. So they have this experience. It's interesting. He says, it happened to them as it happened to us at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Here is a, a replication of Pentecost, but now amongst the Gentile people. Very significant. Mm. Then you come on to Acts chapter 19. Stop me if I'm talking to you. Oh, much. carry on, sir. <laughs> in Acts chapter preach 19. Preach it, brother, preach it. In Ephesus, <laughs> Paul has this group of men. He says, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Say, we don't even know that there's such a thing as the Holy Spirit. He says, then, well, what are you baptized? Oh, we received John's baptism. And then he explains to them all about Jesus. He says, John's baptism was, forgiven for, sin, for, was for forgiveness of sins. Then he explains about Jesus. And they're baptized in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So again, in my book, when a person is baptized, before they're baptized, they're only bapti baptized as, as an outward uh, signal of an inner work of the Spirit that they're born again. And yet, it was subsequent to that that Paul lays his hands on them and the, the Holy Spirit falls on them. Mm -hmm. So in the book of Acts, which is our pattern, our guidebook, there does seem to be an experience of the Holy Spirit that is subsequent to and distinct from salvation. That Acts 10 incident, by the way, I think that although theologically they're separate, I think they can in practice happen simultaneously. And right. I think that's what happened in Acts, Acts chapter 10. 10. They yes. were saved and filled with the Spirit all at the same time. Right. But it did happen. So this is very relevant to the question I'm, I'm going to ask you in just a minute. So there is a very distinct difference. In other words, we will know when we're filled with the Spirit. Um, we know when we're saved, and we know our sins forgiven, and we have peace with God. And, and many people will testify that that is the thing that happened at that point in time. And one of the things they knew, they were full of guilt the day before, they were, came at peace. They were at rest. They, they knew their sins were forgiven. They knew there was a new start. And a new, they didn't understand it all, but, but, but that was what they knew at that point. What is the significance then? And, 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 and how can somebody sort of watching in today and say, okay, Warren, that's fine. I don't know what I've had. 
<laughs> yeah, I, 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 they, you know, how will they know when they're filled with the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit? How will they know? That's a very good question, <laughs> and I'm delighted to, be, to answer it. it use that expression baptized in the holy spirit i think it's very significant don't you mm, i do is because yeah. i think that jesus says that uh, you will be baptized in the holy spirit and baptism has to do with immersion complete submersion it has to do with initiation and i think that this experience of the spirit we, we're talking about this filling this outpouring this enduing this coming upon it has this sense of completeness of a total not just being filled but surrounded uh, as if we'd actually dipped wholly into the holy spirit mm -hmm. so how do we know whether a person's had that we receive the spirit by faith but what's the evidence of it mm. that's a moot question <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're now going to open up another 20 uh, different directions absolutely it, yeah. <laughs> but I, i'll i'll tell you what happened historically i'll tell you what the bible says and then i'll tell you what i believe <laughs> Get him in the right Get order. Get him in the right order. <laughs> well, I, I put the Bible in the middle. That's all right. It's quite interesting that this question about how do we know whether a person's baptized in the Holy Spirit, put it another way, what is the initial evidence of the filling of the Spirit, was a question that was uh, prevalent at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Up until that time, many people claimed an experience of the Holy Spirit, a second blessing that was largely a, a sanctification experience. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a Pentecostal holiness movement. People were claiming that they had received a blessing of the Holy Spirit that dealt with sin in them. Uh, around that time, there was a man called Charles Parham in Topeka, Kansas. And uh, he wants to know, well, well, what is the, the real evidence? And so he asks his students in this small Bible school uh, to, to go away over Christmas and study this question, look in the book of Acts and say, in the book of Acts, what is the evidence for the baptism of the Holy Spirit? They come back, he comes back to his Bible school, they give the reports in, and unanimously they say, when we looked in the book of Acts, the evidence was speaking in, in tongues. tongues. And then on January the 1st, uh, 2001, at the, right at the beginning of the century, Agnes Osman spoke in tongues, and that was the beginning of the whole Pentecostal Did you say 2001? I'm sorry, <laughs> 1901. I, thanks for giving correction. It took me a little while. <laughs> <laughs> 1901, over 100 years ago. Yes. And that was the beginning of the modern Pentecostal movement that now claims over 500,000 people in the world who claim a Pentecostal charismatic experience of the Holy Spirit. So, so historically, that was the beginning of modern Pentecost. An attempt to answer this question, what is the evidence? Mm -hmm. Now we come to the book of Acts. What is the evidence? Is tongues essential as an evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit? Let me say, first of all, that we're only talking about the initial evidence. There should be other evidences we're not, it's not even the most important evidence. Mm -hmm. I think the most important evidence is a holy life, a life that glorifies Jesus Amen. and bears witness regularly Amen. in power to Jesus Christ. Those are the evidences I love for the fruit of the Spirit and so on. Uh, but the question is not what's the most important, but what is the initial evidence? Obviously on the day of Pentecost, they spoke in tongues. That's how they knew. Then in um, Acts chapter 10, when the Holy Spirit is poured out in Cornelius' house, they spoke in tongues and praised God. And Peter says, oh, I know now that this is the genuine thing because they received it in the way that we received it at the beginning. Here is a replication of the experience with a replication of the sign of the indication of the falling of the Spirit. You get into Acts chapter 19 and again, what happens to them is that when these 12 men receive the filling of the Holy Spirit, when it falls on them, they speak in tongues and they prophesy. So tongues occurs there. It's interesting that in Acts chapter 8 at Samaria, there is no indication of speaking in tongues, but there is some indication that there was some visible or audible recognizable sign. If it had been just they sat there and they said, now you've got the Holy Spirit, then why would the guy want to exactly, buy it? Exactly. So there is some evidence there. Let me, let me put it this way. I don't think you can point to a scripture that says, you must speak in tongues 
to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. What I say is this, and now I come into what I believe. <laughs> 